computer. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, so Matthew Fogel back on the internet uh, with whatever this is. Uh, uh, and we have uh, Jacob John Rieswick, uh, Lord Open, um, a very dear old friend of mine. Uh, and yes, we're getting old. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe one gotcha, both getting a bit gray. Welcome, thanks for uh, thanks for doing this. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, um, thanks for having me, Matt. This is very nice, very yeah. kind introduction. Appreciate it. <laughs> so um, yeah, I we're in the we're in the second year of the rat since year of the rat started. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's so. I thought this was a good time to kind of start this uh, little podcast, and and I certainly intend on moving into, um, you know, I, I was talking with my my wife earlier today, and she suggested, you know, we've got, you know, there's so many people in the Niagara regional scene that uh, we need to get to. Uh, so this is probably going to expand, and, or you know, being ADD, this will be it, and then there'll be nothing in the war. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, yeah, I know. Uh, sometimes you have uh, big plans and uh, high expectations, and just life gets in the way. Yeah, yeah. But but other times you decide to make no plans, and the next thing you know, you have 200 episodes of Friday nights behind you. And uh, and there we go. That's a segue. Yeah. Um, so You're over 200 episodes. I believe so. Yeah, wow. I I guess because it went for that. about five years or so, right? So that's yeah. at least that's more like two hundred and fifty possibly. Yeah, mayhap, mayhap. I mean I'm sure we can look it up. Um yeah, I'm I'm wearing yeah, well, the shirt. I try Whoa. you know what? I I swear I started numbering them, so I, I'm pretty sure we got to a two hundred of that I, I'm pretty sure we at least got to a two hundred 200th episode I, are you sitting at a computer i'm on my uh, phone yeah i can look I that up say, actually. You, <laughs> i could actually look that up try looking it up i, I, like, I, I know we had a 150th anniversary celebration um so I, the actual titles i don't know if they have the numbering but i feel like i i don't you know what it's probably by date yeah because i know i was obsessive about recording the dates well what i can tell you is that you have uploaded 321 recordings to archive.org and that goes yeah, back right. right to psychosomatic climax machine and lord open uh yeah. your radio shows and i guess maybe that's a good place to start is is i i think that's where you and i first met was probably at brock radio in the old white building uh, my first, when I think I first met you would be like, yeah, it's around radio days, possibly a little before even. Yeah. Well, I was, I was, I was taking uh, a couple of courses and I, um, I was in a couple of courses with Ann Sulikowski. And so I think that was originally, yeah, there was some, and I swear I met you at like, uh, poetry reading or some shit. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It definitely happened as well um around that <laughs> certainly around those times as well but yeah we've definitely been in the same scene even when we were on different paths yeah yeah uh and so the radio show then i was in uh i had two at brock well three actually mm -hmm. over from about 97 i think i started at brock radio 1997 Okay. Until about 2000, late 2000, maybe early 2001, I stopped. Um, I was in the, I was doing the Psychosomatic Climax Machine, mm -hmm. which was a radio show where we yep. played space rock and uh, an ambient music, basically a lot of ambient and a lot of space rock to start, and then it got more ambient. Mm -hmm. Um, after that, I was, uh, yeah, no, I was in that band too, that I mentioned it was a band also. Mm -hmm. So well, like, no, you didn't, but yeah, yeah, I knew that, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Like sorry. So, Climax Machine was also an ambient and that, band. And we had, and we played with Bill, Bill Mason mm -hmm. and, uh, also Daryl Mason, his son. Right. 
and it was me and Anson with Kevin. Who's who's a pretty well known musician as well in his own. Well, way. and I think still goes by the name Psychosomatic Climax Machine. I don't know, or it did anyway for a while after. Um. Yeah, like a side note, I worked with him at Cytel at one point. So yeah, yeah, um, great guy. Yeah. Oh, uh, so then I did my uh, that's and then I that's when I came up with Lord Open mm -hmm. it was for that show. I had this like uh, because I like sp space rock and like Kiss. Kiss had this thing where they were like larger than life comic book style, like superheroes. Right, right. They they ended up making a lot of comic books, so I. And they were like a band that was like highly sort of like revered both like ironically and unironically. Yeah, but very the theatrical, but also a, a, and also a straight ahead rock band. But also band, kind of hard kitschy rock band. too, right? Yeah. Like, so, but I thought, I thought that was the bee's knees and it really made a lot of sense to me that like, you know, people like there was a sort of hero worship that went on with like fans and rock and roll stars. Yeah. And Kiss was like, well, if we're going to be hero worshipped, we should really be like a larger than life thing that warrants that kind of attention. Right. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I just really, that really stuck with me because it worked for them too, right? It's like, right. They went over the top and then they kind of got an over the top response, which was, which was cool. And then I also like, I was really into Hawkwind. Yeah, okay, yep. Right, who I consider to be like the first sp proper space rock band where they were like, the science fiction was like the, the, the basis of their, so I, I guess it was like, uh, anyway, they just had an, an outer space theme, science fiction themes that ran through the whole thing and then. Uh, right their connection with Michael Moorcock, who was an author I really respected, who had like a, just an ungodly amount of like fantasy novels and stuff that were all very fun and interesting. And he was heavily involved in like the Hawkwind mythos. And so just the idea of combining larger than life themes and like novels with music. Right. And like situating like a musical experience in this like, fantasy kind of sci-fi landscape it just really really appealed to me and with the psychosomatic climax machine it was supposed to be all about having characters and broadcasting from like different places like the moon or the hollow earth and all kinds of other madness because <laughs> you're on the radio right you no one can see so you just say you know, of course theater of the mind yeah right so yeah, so that is when I did come up with the idea of Lord Open, who was a, a time traveling spaceman. <laughs> so he just he just he just does science fiction stuff. He travels through space and time, like Star Trek. <laughs> uh, and uh, I got it from I was playing Zelda: A Link to the Past at that time. Okay. And my character in Zelda was named Lord Jacob Open. Cause, uh, and so. Or, or I was using Open as a, a name and then Zelda puts Lord in front of it. Like I didn't put o like Lord in and first. Oh, and right. Right. Because Zelda of calls you Lord Zelda. whatever. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. So I'd been using Open as like a. A video game name for a while which was because I was taking Tai Chi at the time and I was very into the idea of open systems uh, anyway so then that's how that kind of started yeah there's a whole conversation right there about open systems as well I mean you know yeah well right and then like which led into like the jamming and the it, it was like it was all a very kind of a lot of one thing leading to another some stubbornness <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah that's for me i mean 
just to like, let's just, if we change gears and just talk about jamming, right? Yeah. Like what we were doing. <clears throat> After like years of it, I really got, to, to me, it became like, intramural sports <laughs> right you know like a house league like right even like people that like get together and play like ball hockey in their 30s or just right 21 or like any kind of like amateur sporting event yeah some people are better at the sport than others but if it's just like you're just horsing around anybody of any skill level is allowed to play right right and you don't and that take was it like, too serious. And, and that was always a very early rule with BMT from what I understood was just get up on the stage. You don't know how to play anything. Here, grab this. Here's a kazoo or whatever it happened to be. Yeah, and it was, it was very much... I don't know. I don't... Like, honestly, like, I just love playing. Mm -hmm. I never thought anyone would be particularly interested in watching me play <laughs> right right i uh loved playing but didn't necessarily have the temperament to like or really desire to like sit down and really hammer out songs mm -hmm. and like even though I, like i did a lot of my own like solo stuff but it's all like like i just wanted to like do it, get it over with, move on to the next thing. Right. You know, and I just, just for whatever reason, didn't have, I think if I had that brain that would, uh, could really obsess about it. Cause I think to do some, like, well, a lot of it properly, you can't necessarily hammer it out in like two to eight hours. Yeah, I mean, I really like two to eight weeks, you know. Yeah, and I really identify with that because I that that's an issue I have. I mean, when I when I when I got that when I got the new board that's over my shoulder there, I did spend I did spend a couple of weeks like agonizing about okay, now I'm going to get that album done. But then then I had that re you know, and then I had that uh, realization. I'm 47 years old. If I was going to finish an album, I would have done it by now. You know, I'm not, you know, you either are or you aren't. And um, that's just not, you know, that, that, that ain't me. I mean, I, I, um, I fell in, for me, I, I fell into the improvisation and was doing it, you know, was doing it separately um, with, uh, with projects that I was in and then, and then with, and, and then with, uh, uh, Ear of the Rat and subsequent subsequent uh, projects um, like Dave Donnelly's Full Spectrum Alliance and and now you know back with SB5. Um, but I w the the idea of actually sitting down and composing from beginning to end. I mean, it was something I had a lot of interest in when I was 18, 19 years old, and I've got a lot of songs that are written in in notebooks back there. That, but I don't necessarily have the drive to do that. And it's funny because I sat with that board for months in here, futzing around. And then, uh, and then I heard that Tom uh, had started going, that Dan had invited Tom to come out and start it up again because um, uh, Full Spectrum Alliance had kind of left and so the space was open again. And Tom started going back and you know, I kind of, I, I, I talked to Johnny and I, and I talked to Tom and, and I talked to Merv and I was like, you know, kind of tentative, like I'm not really ready to go back in yet. And I don't want to come in and have Tom being like, oh, it's the Matt show now. Frickin' Fogel's coming here. So I, I was really apprehensive about actually proposing anything or, or suggesting we start recording again. But it had apparently been going on for f three or four months and Merv recorded a couple and and Johnny recorded a couple, but they didn't get uploaded as SP5 or anything like that. Um, they just, okay. it just happened. Um, and so I, I, I know actually that's something else I should probably look at doing while we're in COVID-19 land. Are you sure is, Merv? 
because I feel like Merv has uploaded some. Merv has uploaded, yeah, Merv has uploaded to Archive Org, but I don't think that any of the ones from late 2019 were done. Oh, okay, being. yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. And I think there were a few around uh, September and October that were, there were jam nights during that period that they did make it to an H4N. Um, so I got to track those down and, and get permission to upload them or not. It depends on what Tom wants to do, right? I mean, I leave that with him. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, that that's what happened is, is come December, I was like Christmas break and I decided, and I asked, I, I asked the guys if they wanted to do it. And, um, because I figured, you know, I I, I kind of stood on the background, and you and I for a period of time kind of co-hosted, um, but it was always like I was kind of left, you know, I was kind of, um, you know, tried to stay in my lane. Um, but yeah, that that's what happened. Is is uh, everyone? A bunch of people said yes. I texted them. I know I texted you during that time as well. And suddenly, a bunch of people showed up at 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 Dan's uh, Dan's house SB five. Uh, on December 28th, <laughs> and I couldn't make it because actually, I had to, <laughs> I had to go to Toronto. It's a bad space. It's a great space, actually. From a There's recording like, perspective, it's beautiful. It's, There's good it's acoustics. Just, it's, it, it's plenty big. Yep. Without being, like, too big. Yep. Right? And uh, between the insulation and, and on the Dan's one got side. it's nice kit, too, right? So, yeah, that helps. And you know, there's the insulation on the one side, and there's blankets on the other side. Yeah. And there's a nice piano that doesn't get used enough. Um, it's, yeah, it it's got it's it's a good room. In fact, uh, even doing multi-tracking, kind of on an aside here, I've been using um, a couple of mics and an XY just to record the room, and bringing that in as natural reverb. But oh. I digress. Um, yeah, so at any rate, I didn't end up going on the 28th, but but um, uh, Johnny did record it, and that's what's actually just been uploaded to Space Basement Collective YouTube page that I, I launched earlier this week. Because like I said, lots of time on my hands. Um, okay, so you've got a YouTube page. Yeah. How I'll, long has the YouTube page been up? Uh, three days. Okay. <laughs> I don't feel so bad about not having heard of it. No, it, it's been up three days and so far, and everything links back to Archive Org. Um, that's how I've been doing it. Fantastic. So, you know, there's a, right now I've been going track by track and uploading track by track. No video, just, just the, basically a screenshot um, of the uh, album cover. Uh, <clears throat> but that that's, yeah, so that's what's happening. Oh, you're... Wow. So you're uploading like each individual track on, on the YouTube own? page. Yes. Oh, wow. And I've got, <laughs> and, that's impressive. and what I've, well, it, it didn't take a lot of work because I've got it set to auto upload. So okay. they've already been uploaded to YouTube and, and they've been dropping every two hours. <laughs> so, oh, and wow, and well each done. one of those pages drives back, you know, drives traffic back to archive. Because they, yes. they, they each have the link back to archives.org. Fantastic. So You're I'm, gonna have I'm like, sh three views. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say you're going to have like about 10,000 videos up by the end of the month. <laughs> and three views. <laughs> yeah, three views. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that brings you up to speed. That's what's happening with SB5. Um, three views, though, that'll be better than our live streams, which typically had two viewers for yeah. everyone. Yep. Yeah, well, that's the other thing, right? The technology is at the point where YouTube Studio now allows live streaming directly. So I could do it with this phone. I mean, I could take this phone, set yeah. it up on set it up on the hot water heater, and hit record and and upload it. But I'm not a, I'm we're not at that point. I, I don't think that Tom's interested in going back to you know, you the know antics for, of it. <laughs> <laughs> for having been early adopters of YouTube, mm -hmm. right? Because we're in there like 2006, 2007. Right. Uh, I'm losing you there for right now. Oh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine, yeah. Okay, you went all, you got, you roboted out on me for a bit. <laughs> okay, sorry about uh, that. 
anyway, I was saying like for, uh, you know, being fairly early adopters of YouTube, so like 2006, 2007, you know, we're in there pretty close to the beginning. Yeah. Didn't really go like the PewDiePie route. <laughs> no, we did not. <laughs> but, uh, no. No, no Lamborghini parked outside of your uh, building there. <laughs> no, it didn't take off. Um, I th but I think it was good. And, you know, at one point, just in terms of, like, people treating me less like a weirdo around town, <laughs> like, having the live streams and seeing, like, how innocuously weird it is. Yeah. It, it it made a difference. Well, and I think that for me, the other the other part of it for me, and this kind of brings us back to what I wanted to talk about, is the, you know, there was always a radio show feel to what we were doing, to what you were doing even before we set up the webcam, where you know from the callouts to the station IDs um, that we did, um, and then I've kind of brought back, you know coming to you live from SB5. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. um, I, I, I think that that was always, you know, it, 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 I think it translated well to, to the YouTube in that way because it, it was, it was portrayed and it still is, the, the concept of it, I think, is, is a radio show. That's, that's the, the packaging of it. I think, and and ha it has been, as opposed to, say, uh, this is an album. You know, I mean, some members have talked about, well, we're doing an album every Friday. It's like, I never really thought of it that way. I always thought I of always it more like. I always did think of them as episodes. As an episode, and and you called them episodes as well. Yeah, exactly. They were right. called episodes, and and yeah, that's and I think that that's a really neat part of it, and kind of an extension or or a translation of the open stage moving into the open basement. Yeah. Uh, we did, well, we were with BMT, right? Mm -hmm. Billy's Masonic Tavern. So that was the, with that group, we, we did have that, the space downtown for about six yeah. months there or so. Yeah. Six months to a year. So, so it was it, West Hill Tavern, you guys were doing stuff. And then from what I understand, and then I remember I got, you You guys let me play one show uh, as, as sublingual. And I, I remember I being really nervous about it. And you're like, no, it's fine, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I opened I opened for Billy's Masonic Tavern, which was great. Because it was like, all right, we came up and, and you know, uh, Frank and Jeff were, were were just faced, and it was yeah. a good time. And then and then after that, the stage just kind of filled up. <laughs> yeah, right. And yeah, it was fun. Uh, but that was open, right? So it was open yeah. to the public. Right. Right. Exactly. And uh, and like you say, it was an open stage, but it was more like anyone could come up on stage and start playing along. Right. Whereas, right, like as you say, opposed to an open mic where you, people get up, do their thing, and then make yeah, and that's why person. I clarified that exactly because like you could open, be on stage for first. like fifteen minutes or three hours depending right. on your temperament. Right, right. Yeah, and and that's um, yeah, like I said, that that's kind of um an area I wanted to kind of look into is, is, I mean, this was something that was happening um, at other venues as well, previous to that. I mean, uh, um, like I said, Jerry's Alley had something similar. And I think I got I to gotta track down jo Dr. John Press to <laughs> interview him, speaking of going to people outside of, uh, outside yeah, of the immediate I, scene. I don't think it's, like, it's not new, right? right. Improvising and jamming. So it was, new to me at that time as it was and to certainly me. yeah and certainly my th the person that introduced me to jamming and jamming along mm. right uh was bill mason right and he was real f like he played with a lot of bands 
but like he would never rehearse with them, right? If they wanted him to play, then he would come out and he would play along and he'd play his thing on top of their thing. Right. And if people liked that, then they would do that together. And if they didn't, then he just didn't continue. He didn't get a call so, back. <laughs> yeah, so he's, it was really weird, right? Because he was sort of like, he was in like seven or eight bands all at once, right? But he didn't really rehearse with anybody. He'd get together and jam out because he loved to play. Yeah. And was, like was he, he a he, saxophonist? I, I, I'm sorry for... Well, I, that, I, I, at I, the I, time, I, that I, was I, what I, he did. Okay. Right? That was his onstage thing because no one plays saxophone, right? Gotcha. And about saxophone and rock and roll, like, they go, hit, they oh, go well together. So yeah. it, Especially well late 70s, early 80s. I mean, I think that, you know, that, yeah, at like, one point, you know, at one point, guitar solos, they actually, there was a, a side note. There was a divergence, right? Because um, hair metal, hair metal, electric guitar solos, but mainstream, mainstream rock at that time, Huey Lewis in the News, Billy Joel, saxophone solo. Right. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So, so he's, people were happy to get someone who played saxophone. In. Right. Right. Um, but see, for, for me, Billy was weird because he was like really like, like an angry dude. <laughs> okay. And one of the things he was angry about was he never made really any money playing in these bands. And it's like, well, he never really like joined the bands, right? <laughs> like <laughs> he was just there to play. And then like even with BMT, he was like he was crabby that he wasn't like raking it in. Right. Doing the BMT stuff because we hadn't like monetized it properly. It's like, right. well, I mean, you're here too. And like, we were promoting the heck out of it, and like, putting a lot of time and effort in. And yeah, although I think that I think that it suffered by the success of the wrong demographic, much in the same way as the original club did, where you get a bunch of starving musicians together to play, and none of them can afford the bar. So it doesn't matter that you got the well drinks because you're not going to make rent. Um, yeah. And that's the problem, no, and, right? Yeah. So yeah, and that's the thing, right? It wasn't like you couldn't the, the people that would come out to do the jam or to hear the jam. Yeah, there were, just wasn't enough of them, right? Spending enough money to really make it like something you make a living out of, right? And exactly. Not, maybe if it had gone on for like a year or four, it would have grown. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was in kind of doing this research for this. Uh, I, I found out that, for example, there are some sustainable open stages that still exist today. From what I under, from what I understand, the, there's a practice which is done on industry night at the Drake and it is an open stage. And the whole theme is practice. Um, and apparently that that's sustainable, or at least it was before COVID-19 hit. And and that was um, that was an ongoing session right in you know uh right in the west end of toronto there in the hipster hipsterville area <laughs> so yeah. i think that you know i don't know if it was before its time or if there was like i think actually at that time period um late 90s early 2000s you know st Catharines wasn't just wasn't doing that great financially i think as well and so there was that aspect well it was the recession exactly yeah right like no one like it was hard times all over right and uh well this so like if we're talking like when we had the space right mm -hmm. that's 2003 yeah and that would that was the bond street garage january to that. june yeah, yeah. so uh, and really that all came out of just sort of like we wanted a place to play right and they were, were going to rent it to us for cheap. And we thought like, well, if we just rented it to other people as a place to jam. Right. Not only could you like practice here, you could charge people to come see you. Right. right. Cause it's, it was a performance space and like you could just practice there. Right? Yeah. And I had a lot of good times. Like, like I have a lot of good memories of that as well, because, um, 
Well, we, I, I was emceeing two different poetry groups that were there as well at that we time, during that time. Every month. Yeah. Uh, easily like 20 days out of 30. Like the people who weren't us. Right. Yeah. And then the other days, like we, we just threw our own shows. So something was happening, right? Yeah. And, you know, we, we made, we always made enough money every month to like cover the rent we were paying. Right. And that's, and then, so we were, it was like, we got our own performance space for free. Right. Like anyway, we, we never really made like, we made some money, but you know, between six guys, it wasn't, it was like two, 300 bucks a month. It wasn't right. a lot. Uh, but because we were letting the place go so cheap, what did happen and which I realized what was going on after about three months, basically the people renting it to us, they're just paying attention to who came through and like how well they did. Right. Right. So at the end of like six months of it being like one of the more happening spaces in downtown St. Catharines, yep. they like shut it down, reopened it as like their own thing. Yep. Instead of having like 30 shows a month, they had the four fairly pro people that like, you know, knew what they were doing had big yeah. email lists, you know? Yeah. And, and, and that was good for the knack, but I mean, I remember that kind of like opportunities kind of dried up at that point for being allowed to play there, <laughs> like being able to play there. Uh, well, myself, that's the for problem, myself. right? It sort of, <clears throat> in terms of well i i and i don't think the fact that like the people that run the place at the time lived across the street didn't necessarily care for the ruckus yeah didn't have something to do with it right cuz right. it did it was like kind of it was busy there's a lot of different things happening and like you say like lots of people that wouldn't be out playing anyway otherwise yep we made it real easy i think it was like we were charging 50 bucks for a weeknight and then 75 on a weekend right right which is i mean if you don't think you can make 75 dollars throwing a show for a night i mean five bucks a ticket that's whoa, how many tickets is that Fifteen tickets at yeah. five bucks a head. You, I don't know. You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be getting out of the basement if you can't at least get another fifteen people out. Yeah, and boy bands can't in St. Catharines. At least not when we were in them. <laughs> I don't know how many shows I went to, like, or how many times, like, doing the jam. Like you, like the one time we pulled all the stops were in the soil. And called yep. up everybody who'd ever like had anything to do with the group. Like, come on out. Yep. And sure, we got 15 people came out, all of them to play. And none yep. of them brought a single person with them. I know, right? <laughs> and it was such a glorious noise. <laughs> like, I have no idea what it was, but, you know, that was art. I mean, you know what the kicker is? I felt like the In the Soil people felt pranked by us. You know, because I don't know if they realized we were being earnest. You know what I mean? Like, like, like wait, what? <laughs> what are you guys doing? It was, <laughs> yeah, that was nuts. It was so loud. You know, you know it, like, because it, it almost seemed like it was going into, like, Frank Zappa land or, like, and and, and without the virtuosity. Um, or, uh, and I'm or, 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 um, you know, like just some sort of, you know, like performance art, like, you know, kind I kind of thing. like, I, I mean, it was great, show, but I think it sounds pretty good. We'd get to get a recording of it. Yeah. The, the recording, you know, it, it's not bad. It, it actually, it's not bad. It, it gels in some points. Um, yeah, I think it lacks a little bit of, uh, 
it's not dynamic really yeah it but starts I mean, off loud and just thunders along until it peters out i just i just felt like we became a parody of ourselves like we got up there and just did an andy kaufman kind of thing you know like <laughs> that's the only thing about it just <laughs> it was like uh, okay here's 15 people everybody solo <laughs> But no, it does stand on its own. It's not. It's not horrible. And uh, well, there, the, the problem other... was, I swear, what I blame is like, I think Dave was there, and he brought like his singing bowls. Right. Right. And it's like, well, we got these dumb things, and like, you don't, you don't want to rock out and then like necessarily go into singing bowls. <laughs> right. You either begin with it or end with it. I thought we right. might as well start with it. So I had a little talk with everyone before the show. Right. Look, Dave's got the singing bowl. We want to start with that. Everyone just like chill out, at least for the first two, three minutes and just let it right. come in quiet and slow. And then everyone like, <laughs> like spazzed right out in like <laughs> before anything had even started happening. <laughs> we were doing sound check. Oh, so not good. everyone had even like fully like plugged in and turned on. I know. <laughs> it's so good. Ooh. Somebody made a noise because of sound check and like <laughs> half of the percussion section freaked out. <laughs> just, just lost it. <laughs> oh well. <laughs> I don't know. So it was, so it was so. Yeah. Oh, it was great. It was great. Um, so let's jump back a little bit from, um, you know, to BMT and, and, and where that continued to and, and, and how that kind of morphed into what became Ear of the Rat. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it was Jeffrey, right? Yeah. Jeffrey also played with Billy, but Jeffrey right. was never in Psychosomatic Climax Machine. Right. Although I think he did jam with us a few times as the Psychosomatic Climax Machine. But I'm not 100% certain, because I know he was in a band with Billy and Daryl, so they had their own thing. Mm -hmm. And then he also had his solo. Yeah, I think that one was unusual too. species. I think it was. Yeah, that's right. He talked about that. That was that was the um, the one he the, with Wade, I, I believe it was. Wade was in that too. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, and they, I mean, they were they were all right. I saw them once, I think. At, do you remember Basement Dwellers? Yes. It was out on Hartzell Road. Yes. Yeah, it was like under the um, under the the first plaza by the golf course or whatever, wasn't it? That's Is that right. the one I'm thinking of? Yeah. Yeah, and it was like underneath the plaza. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was pretty rad. Um, yeah, I saw them play there. No, and I did see them another time too. There was a, I forget what the place was called. It's not there anymore. Uh, it was off of Bunting. We're like. Towers was where the Mandarin is now and Canadian Tire. Okay. The Canadian Tire Financial Services. Right. Installer. So like there's like a pharmacy that's at the end of that plaza there, and there that was a bar at one point. Okay, so yeah, I know where you're there too. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I forget what it was called though. Like down under or something like that yeah it had some sort of tropical theme i do remember i know of what you i know of what you speak <laughs> uh yeah uh they were good so jeffrey i think he must have played with bmt a couple of times because he knew billy and he was just a, he was just always up to jam right yeah and and there's actually there are recordings when i was looking up the stuff that jim warring had done um uh there there were there there are specifically two recordings with Jim and Jeff that were at the BMT at the That's right, because they were totally site. there all the time for the uh speechless. Right. Right. 
or two bond. Yep. It started out as speechless. It went to two bond because we got in trouble. Yep. From misusing the man's sculpture. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. That, I thought that was so funny. I had this really dumb like telephone conversation with that guy. Because mm -hmm. the NAC people like didn't let us talk to him for some reason. And then like, but also couldn't explain to us what the problem was. Okay. Right. And it was just like, yeah, because basically from the NAC people that were talking to us, they were like, well, he doesn't like what you're doing. So you can't use that name. You can't use that word because he owns it or something. And like, what is happening? It just doesn't make any sense. And like, what are we doing that he doesn't approve of? Well, you know what you're doing. He doesn't That's approve. Well, what does that mean? So then like after like two months of like getting the runaround, I just looked the guy up and talked, called him directly. Uh -huh. And I talked to him for like three minutes. So it didn't go very smooth, but he made it very clear that he had like contracts with the NAC and like with other places that, had his installations up right which specifically forbid like kind of what it seemed like we were doing which was turning his capitalizing art on his art yeah right right <clears throat> and uh yeah he was yeah, probably like, insulted that you know he didn't put it up there as a menu board <laughs> or as a title board yeah right and, yeah. exactly and that's sort of like that's what you're doing I'm like wow well, I guess. I mean, honestly, I don't think anyone knew it was there. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't until I saw a picture of it that someone had taken that was hanging inside the gallery. Right. And I'm like, what? Really? That's up there? And then I went on and looked. So I, I didn't consider it very decent signage. And yeah. we, we'd gone with like a whole other thing too, like a logo and stuff. And we had yeah. a sign that didn't have anything to do with that. But anyway. And then, but um, to Bond Street it became. That's right. <clears throat> which was easy because that's just the address. Yep. Um, but yeah, that guy, like I understood what he was telling me, but for some reason he like, like I tried to explain to him, like, look, we didn't understand we were screwing with your business. Right. With like, that's why I wanted to talk to you. I didn't understand what's going on. Right. To, you know, if we've screwed up your business and there's anything I can do to help straighten that out for you, just ask, right? I, don't, I got no problem. That's our bad. Yeah. And then he started yelling at me. I hate you. I don't want anything to do with you guys. What are you? <laughs> no, you don't understand. Right? Art, artistic temperament, right? You don't understand what I'm saying to you. Like, well, I, I think I do. And I just thought I apologized and offered anything <laughs> that I could do to make it better, right? Right. Like, and what it was interesting to me, because he was this artist. Yeah. His whole art was about, like, language and how like it's insufficient to really like get across meaning <laughs> to our fellow humans. And I'm like, yeah, I right. get why you think that is you don't listen, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's why you think words don't work because you're not a good listener. <laughs> uh. That's so funny. <clears throat> but yeah, and it was that simple. It's like, business contracts i don't know why the people at knack like translated that into he just hates you and um he doesn't like what you're doing he's i don't think he thinks you're cool like, <laughs> what so what <laughs> like what, anyway <laughs> that's about the time i left too just you know there's the, the communication was so terrible yeah it was obvious they were just like we had a six month contract and they were just you know they'd already seen that they could make it work and how right. to make it work 
and it was just a matter of time before they took it over and made, you know, why have why bother dealing with us? Right, exactly. You know, when they could, it'd be less people around, less hassle, and they could make more money. You know. So, yeah. Oh, I guess I don't blame them for doing that, but it was. Well, it's certainly understandable as well. And and like, like it was better in one way, but like you say, right? It sort of closed a lot of doors all at once. Yeah. You know. But open yeah. new ones because you know we are, after all, talking about Home Rock, yeah. and that moved us into Home Rock. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and th that experience, right? Taking it out of the basement, like getting out there. It, I think, I still think it's worthwhile get, if you get a chance to get out and play in front of people. Because mm -hmm. there is a, it is different. Uh, it's one of the nice things, though, about doing the live stream, right? Yeah, and it's interesting with all this COVID-19 stuff because, uh, uh, like, like I think it's so neat. We've seen so many professional musicians, uh, you know, doing Instagram, doing YouTube, video, doing live streams, Facebook live streams, all this stuff. And it's like, well, yeah, you guys just discovered Home Rock. <laughs> you know, you <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's not the same as, like, getting in front no. of a crowd. Yeah. Um, but it can simulate it right and for especially like you say like these musicians right they've been getting that thirty thousand person crowd high right three times all, a week all the facebook years. love <laughs> He's showing yeah up right it's like <laughs> ah, i need it need that ad adulation <laughs> it's like you can you can pretend it's happening if you're online you know it's like a thousand people saw this. I bet you they all loved it. <laughs> you know? You can, it's, yeah. It, it's, I, I certainly think in terms of like, from like college radio experience. Yeah. I don't see any reason to get involved with independent radio right now or radio in general. Mm -hmm. uh, it, if you can do a podcast. Well, this is the thing, right? I think that more people are listening to radio format stuff than ever before, thanks to the audio podcast. But I don't think terrestrial radio outside of uh, as a training ground. I mean, there, there, are, there are good radio stations still, you know, public radio here and in, here and in the States. Like I think of KEXP off the top of my head out of Washington, you know, Seattle. Seattle's uh, public radio, which is like a modern rock station. Um, I think there's some areas where it's still exciting, but I think podcasts are where it's at. Uh, it really is. And it has become super fine tuned, right? Because, you know, I think more people are listening to long content radio than ever before, but it's not relegated to the AM airwaves like it was. And, you know, maybe it's just because I'm old, but I want to hear talk radio. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'm not. Uh, I'm listening to music half as much as I was in favor of like talk radio stuff. Although I'm doing podcasts less often and YouTube more often for my talkie talkie right now. Um, but. Uh, well, just after I got that board, I went down a rabbit hole of uh, of a whole bunch of production. Uh, vlogs and YouTube podcasts and so forth. So, um, which is neat because all these people that I idolized, but in, never, you know, are now doing interviews and 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 it's like, oh, well, you can find out how that you know Tears for Fears uh, album was produced because there's like an hour long interview with the guy who produced it, oh. you know, and there's, you know, as an example, um, you know, so that stuff's all there. And that's kind of neat that, you know, because everything has gotten so specialized, we can, we can have this, you know, you can go and get lost for six hours on YouTube, 
you know, for stuff that's oddly specific, you know, like, um, yeah, new wave or no way, you know, new wave from, from the UK or no wave from New York, you know? Well, speaking of the UK, do you remember the Peel sessions? Yeah. John Peel. Yes. Right. So like in those records that turn up all the time. Yep. That's, you know, and that was basically like, it's a radio show. What is it's bands? They come on, they do their their. Yeah, their, and that's actually live. side note. That's what KEXP is doing these days, as as is NPR Tiny Desk. I think that's great too. Um, and you know that's, that's kind of what Era the Rat was meant to be. Yeah, you know, not necessarily like, but but with the BMT kind of rotating membership. Right. People dropping in, dropping on, like. But that was kind of the oeuvre you were going for, like when we started recording it. In that, I considered Ear of the Rat to be a podcast of sorts. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and uh, I think if we'd taken a little more effort to structure it as a podcast, mm -hmm. have a host, yep, have them come on and begin the show, yep perhaps take breaks every now and again and, and talk with people at the show. Yeah. I know when we started doing it on video, you and I started to do that, but it kind of, I think we both kind of lost interest. I mean, I know we've got a few spots up. <laughs> I had, I had plans, yeah. right. About, yeah. cause there were things you could do. You could drop video in and yep. cut it out. And I think we were doing it for a, yeah, but, we like we had gotten. I think what, I think what happened without like and and you know we're keeping this a you know, we're keeping this about the music. So I'm not going there. But I think that we got our. I think that our lives got in the way of the plans for the actual radio show component. My of, computer of it. died too. Yeah, the computer died. Um, and then, uh, and then and I never uh, fully recovered from the that computer dying. <laughs> Yeah, and then there was, and then the second part of it was the other aspect of it was the move from SB4, my place, like right behind this wall, to SB5, which was a better space, but the only downside is Dan didn't have internet, so it, we were back to the the mobile dilemma that we had with SB3, where it was like, okay, <laughs> what are we well, gonna do? The, the problem I thought with SB5 is that it's always been like a sausage fest. <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah and that's still and, true to this day <laughs> which is all right and maybe it's for the best yeah i i think that what's happening now with with space basement 2020 um the new season if you will the the picked up by amazon and netflix yeah. <laughs> revival <laughs> you know um kind of going with that you know the extra season of uh arrested development <laughs> kind of scenario mm -hmm. is um yeah i think it, it's i'm the the concept is still open but the other thing that's happening is um i don't get to vet who comes anymore and but but in in the in the reverse in that i'm looking at it as who is going to work with tom because it, it it always has gone back to i mean you know, the jam is split twice already because of Tom and I don't yeah. want to lose him again because uh, for me, Tom is an integral part of the oeuvre, the whole machination of it, especially, I, I, I don't know if you had a chance to listen, but the stuff he's doing with that chaos pad and his mixing board and his old cassette deck, freaking amazing, just off the charts. Great. And you know, it, 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 that for me is what's making it fun and exciting for me to do do this project again. I mean, I I I I'm really proud of where Full Spectrum Alliance has moved, but what Dave but Full Spectrum Alliance has become what Dave always wanted it to be, which is a band for him. And I mean that with no slight, but but there's no guile about it. It's now Dave's band. And that's that's done well, but it's not it's not the same. It's not the same project and it's a different, it's now a different thing. And, and uh, um, what's happening with that is he's, he's getting together. He's coming down probably once or twice a year. We actually had our last session just before 
uh, the March, just before the, uh, the uh, lockdown happened. Yeah. And we had two days and we went into the old school and we just had a marathon session of writing and recording and there was actual writing involved. He, he did kind of a Tom Waits thing where he said, this is what I'm envisioning for the, this song. Can we, can we do this? And then we did it. And I really like where that's going. There's an actual direction, but you know, the whole thing with the improv and with uh, SP five is that there is no musical direction and that aspect of, that aspect of it, aside from the radio host side of it, I think is really important to it as well. And and again, I that that's why I'm really glad to have Tom, you know, back. So. Yeah, I. So. You know, and that's the thing with the jams, right? Is that uh. The, one of the other things I always considered, especially when as like the person that for the like edited and recorded a lot of it yeah i really considered it the process of like trying to make a silk purse from a sow's ear (laughs) right like it's yeah so we've got something that's like unpolished not unrehearsed kind of all over the place and like let's try and make it a little bit coherent like take and like depending on the piece like some pieces i actually like built songs out of it Mm -hmm. like where i cut it up and like repeated some parts that you know hadn't been repeated right it's like well if we just do this whole thing one more time it's going to sound like on purpose and like cooler you know know, i did that a few times with things it was like yeah i think one time in the 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 barn out back on Lake Street there, mm-hmm. we did like a version of Brainstorm by Hawkwind. Yeah, but it was just like in, in the gun. Maybe garage. it was Master of the Universe. I think it was Master of the Universe. Yeah, and like I think Jared knew like half of the song or whatever. He played like a a couple of bars of it. Mm-hmm. We got like sort of a piece of it together. Yeah. So I like I cut it like I cut like sixty seconds into like a three minute piece. Nice. And, you know, and and it worked, you know. It wasn't perfect, but it sounded like a song, you know. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of that. And then like just trying to get a good recording. Um, and then, you know, sometimes yeah it wasn't easy sometimes to even just get a good recording just because the, the people's volume would always. Yeah. And that was the big always thing. kept turning up, right? Yeah. When you're dealing with two or with either two or four tracks with the H4N, it's like, it is what it is. You know, if, if, um, you know, short of running everything. Um, well, yeah, no, that's the big thing was the volume problem. The, uh, there's always somebody who's got to be up at 11. And they, you know, yeah, we, we were able the, to usually the guitarist. I don't yeah. know what it is about guitar players, but they want to. It helped moving out. to practice amps for a while, but we found that even again, um, you know, you get somebody shows up with a classic 30, and the next thing you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is the loud. <sighs> yeah. It, I, you know, I was fine with it. I, the older I got, the less into it I was. Mm-hmm. Like I want to keep doing music for the rest of my life. I don't want to go deaf now. Yeah, <laughs> like we don't. We don't need to. We're not. We're not trying to hit the back of the room. Right here. Let's just keep it down. Yeah. Well, that's the big thing as well. Is I like you know. I, honestly, I'd I'd rather record at a conversational volume anyway. You get a much better recording i mean maybe you know well and the thing was i think i wanted to do i didn't want to rock out all the time yeah and it it, honestly in the later days i wanted to rock out like a whole lot less and just kind of vibe out a whole lot more right you know like kind of kind of chill and slow and not 
try and get too fancy. Because that was the other thing for me. If you're trying to get something together, just everybody relax. Let's just all go slow, mm -hmm. figure out what everyone's playing, work out something that plays along good. Yep. And then, but keep it like real simple to start and then start branching out from there. Yep. And a lot of the time we would accomplish that. It was easier to do that, I found, with BMT sometimes than with Ear of the Ramp. Mm -hmm. Just depends on who's there, too. Like I say, yeah. me and Tom, I always thought, played together really well. You and I played together really well. Yep. Uh, I mean, almost every other drummer that showed up that was like a drummer that worked really well. Yep. Uh, like Jason Jelly, I always loved it when he was there. Uh, well, I mean, and then we started out with Greg Gunn, obviously. Yep. But he was excellent. Really had a good, like, punk rock kind of. Yeah. Yeah. He was good. Him and Jeffrey played together really well. Yes. Yeah. They were a good duo. And, you know, it wasn't until like a lot later that I realized they were doing covers like half of the time. <laughs> so weird. Right? <laughs> it's like, well, and it's then, just a chord progression now. Because <laughs> everybody else is doing something else. No, no one else is playing that song. <laughs> Glad you two got it together. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I know Jared used to get upset too because I would I didn't recognize like half of the songs he was playing, and I was like, "You you were playing songs." <laughs> For what it's worth, I never played a single. I never played a single cover, and I haven't. I uh, I, I kind of thought it was funny. I started doing like uh, I started doing pop song lyrics. <laughs> I know we did like "Teenage Dream" by Katy Perry quite a bit. I sang that a lot at one point, and then uh, "Jumpin' Jack Flash" I sang a bunch of times too. <laughs> I like that. It came out good. And, but like, you know, I was just saying the words, right? The song right. doesn't sound anything right. like it. Yep. It's like it's a cover now. Well, I I was I was I was uh talking about this earlier. It's I, something I really enjoyed were um your spoken word tirades. I I wouldn't really go so far as to call it rap, but but you you know, you you'd start the with a station I You'd start with a station ID, and then from there yeah. you would go into essentially, you know, essentially uh, doing, you know, being the being the presenter, being the, but just off on, you know, like like a kind of a George Strombolopoulos on acid uh, on his Sunday night show kind of scenario. Like, <laughs> and and there were some great recordings of that uh, that are still online here and there um, on archive.org for those that want to look it up. Um, I always enjoyed that as well. Yeah, well, especially there's... when you got the cor I think it was the Korg with the with the microphone, um, with the uh, brr, brr, brr. <laughs> that that's not doing it justice. But the uh... oh, I sort of remember what you mean. It's been so long. The little you microphone know... on the key on your uh, the vocoder. Yes. Oh, that's what I'm talking about the vocoder on your on your on your. Uh, your, yeah the the synth you had gotten when i when we were doing it at my place that synthesizer is really nice before yeah yeah i haven't got that out in a while yeah see there's a perfect example of like because there was like a, an ambient show i played with like rob and sabino and matt up in mm -hmm. Toronto. Yep. You know, and that that turned out really nice. This I see because like, yeah, every now and again, 
I was sort of hoping to, to get a little more of that sometimes out of Ear of the Rant. We did yeah. get it sometimes. That was, you know, that's well, fine. especially that's when happened. Savino came down with his with his uh, with his little uh, noise crack, his little noise crack toys. Yeah, he just had everything lined. You know, he, everything lined into his little mini FM mixer that he had, and then out to the board, out to an amp or a board, depending on what we had. Um, those nights were always like super ambient, just out of you know, I think it was sometimes it was a matter of, of, of whether you know we were outnumbering <laughs> some of the the heavier guys. Yeah, it's like, and you know, if you listen to a lot of the recordings, to like for the first hour, a lot of times like Tom would get there first and like me and yep. him would hang out. Yeah. So I can't complain really. I got plenty of like what I wanted from it. Right. Right. Um. And like it was good, even when it got noisy a lot of the time. Yeah. Well, I, I, I didn't know it, it was really the cacophony of it, and just the fact that you know it was part of it, right? Yeah. But the other thing for me, it's a situation where there is no real, no realistic expectation of it being any good. Right. But very often. For long periods of time, it was very good. Yes, agreed. Right, like some just some really neat, fun to listen to stuff. Right. Yep. Just lots of things there that are really interesting, but you got to dig for it a little bit. Yeah. Know? And yeah, like going forward, if this becomes like more of a project, that's one thing that I think would be worth pursuing is just going through chunking it down a little bit into the eras and yeah putting well, together greatest hits yeah i think that there's still i think it would still be um worthwhile to curate curate what is there of those 300 and so recordings and and you know have a greatest hits tape <laughs> you know of what of what was uh and you know and that that's part of this as well where i'm like well what are we going to do during lockdown <laughs> you know yeah gotta do something um and i certainly don't want to have you know i don't, I don't want to get anybody sick so like i'm not sick but that's the whole point right we're not you know i've actually I, we got tested because my wife is a nurse and all so oh she yeah tested, right um and so i've been tested and we're fine but pretty scary because she was actually working at Lundy. Ma she didn't work at Lundy Manor, but she had clients at Lundy Manor and that was where that huge outbreak was. So, right. Yeah. She had a rough go. It was pretty stressful. Um, anyway. Uh, yeah. Like uh, I really think that is something that, that would be worthwhile as well as, or, and even curating it into within the era, heavy and soft, ambient and, and so on. Right. Um, yeah. you know kind of collections yeah I never really thought of it that way I, for me the, the more useful thing was like because there's already like like you say there's BMT there's Ear of the Rat yep there's SB5 yep I guess it's sort of SB5-ish Space Basement Collective yeah well I like I said Space it's Basement Collective Space Basement. Yeah, at, like Space Basement Collective is, I, I think, the overarching, it's a retronym, I guess. Yeah. It's what was this? Who are we? Well, we are the collective, like all of us, past and present. That's in my head. That's what I envisioned when I came up with the name. But, um, but yeah, it's, it's the Space Basement 2020 project at SB5 is, I guess, what the current project is <laughs> if that makes sense yeah. so it went from being sb5 to being at sb5 <laughs> yeah it works yeah it was a good space the barn was a good space yep 
What? Oh, just a second. No worries. I thought the fire alarm was going off for a second. Well, as long as it wasn't the fire alarm, we're fine. But it was, and we're it was back. A, it was a walkie-talkie. <laughs> I'm on. I'm still turned on. I'm turning <laughs> me off. Uh, so, yeah, we haven't really, we've covered a bunch of ground, but we haven't managed to, we did get some stuff through, right? Yeah. The well, I mean, show. this is the kicker, right? You're the presenter. I, I was never a presenter. So what have we missed? <laughs> yeah. We had, we met at a poetry reading. Yep. There was a radio show and a band that was a jam band. Yep. There was space rock. There was Lord Open, my radio show, Lord Open's Doorway. Yep. Uh, then there was Billy's Masonic Tavern. Yep. Which was Psychosomatic Climax Machine, but it was everyone that Anne kept Psychosomatic Climax Machine and everyone else became Billy's Masonic Tavern. Right. Basically. Right. Um, and then she became building matchstick, building castles out of matchsticks. Is that what she's doing now? Oh, well, I think she's now performing as Anne Sulikowski. Um, oh, she yeah, actually just, nice. she just, she just put out a new release actually, and it, it's it's quite good. But she's still doing ambient stuff, plays with noise toys. Um, um, uh, yeah, I actually, I just bought, I just bought her latest thing on Bandcamp or whatever. Um, yeah, she's doing her thing. And from what I understand, she's a nurse as well. Um, you know, she's doing her thing. Uh, I haven't actually spoken to her in like five years. I just kind of a side note there. I was like, I got an email notification about a new album release and I just happened to buy it. Um, oh, good. Yeah, support. I'm just supporting, uh, supporting our uh, past and present people and stuff. I also do it, um, I also try to support uh, my other friends that have got releases as well, like John Bolt's had quite a few releases. Stanton Warren with Venture Lift. Uh, he's one of the guys from ISA originally and kind of got involved after uh, with SP5 for a while as well. ISA, that's Inner Sound Accelerator. Right? Inner Sound Accelerator, yep. Yep. Um, and I got to track those guys down too, I think. I was going to say, they were, they were leaving also, St. Catharines just as I was getting started. Yeah. Where and they, they did like one show and then like everyone left town yeah yeah and they ended up actually speaking of ambient instrumental music that's what their that's what their vibe was with a with a space rock kind of flavor you know a kind of a and yeah i feel like they were big of fans of spaceman three that yes. was like a big influence with them yeah exactly yeah i was roommates with uh i was roommates with one of the guitarists from that band and um, they're good people as well. Um, and there are people I want to track down. Like I said, I think I'm going to just keep doing this. Um, but yeah, uh, what was that other band so, that Billy was in at that time? Uh, Magna Cum Loud. Magna Cum Loud. And then from there, um, if you want to go down, if you want to go down the rabbit hole a bit there, Magna Cum Loud, John Press, John Press, John P. Also, um, slightly before this was doing the free pre world at Jerry's alley, but also was in dinner is ruined with the other guy, Wade and dinner is ruined went on to be Gord, be Gord Downey's um, uh, backup band when he did his solo albums. So, okay. Yeah. Not, it's neither here nor there. I mean, and you know, we also went to Brock uh, around the Wait, same time. Wade played with Gord Downey. Yeah. The EOTR Wade? Dinner is ruined. No, I don't think I think it's the other. I have to look it up. Um Dale, no, I'm sorry. I'm wrong. It's Dale like, Morningstar. No, okay. I'm wrong. It's not Wade. It's Dale. Dale Morningstar. I'm like, what? What? No, no, no. Dale Morningstar, Dave Clark, and John Press. Okay. They have yeah. a Wikipedia <laughs> art because my mind my mind was this close to being completely blown. <laughs> No, 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 no. Sorry, no, Wait, I just got real? it. I just got it. <laughs> Nothing's real. <laughs> no, I got it wrong. It's it, it was actually uh it was actually Dale Morningstar, not Wade. Uh sorry, Dale. Um 
you know, because I'm sure he'll be watching this. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and of course, there's also the after the fawning connection because of uh, John Crossingham, uh, who is also, you know, children's author and sometime member of Broken Social Scene. We actually yeah, went yeah. down a route, we actually had quite a bit of conversation about how Broken Social Scene kind of has similar parallels to what we did in that it was also a whole group of Toronto musicians getting together, doing stuff as a side project that became bigger than, you know, well, for a time. I mean, obviously there's, you know, now they're just like a super group, but I mean, I think there was yeah. really a lot of improvisational aspects to the music they do and I, as well. And, um, you know, so, but, but certainly I think it, it'd be too much to say that, you know, this collective, that we've been involved in is is the same because really we're just a bunch of guys in a basement <laughs> yeah well i mean it's always just a bunch of people getting together to play right and right there's different ways to go about it it we just didn't want to rehearse right <laughs> that was the big pain. thing i just wanted to play because and especially with ear of the rat i'm like i'm not I don't want to be a rock star. Yeah. I'm not trying to make this my living. I got a job. It's paying yep. the bills. I got all kinds of time to work on the music. And you know, I did some solo stuff that I tried to like sell, but like mm -hmm. but not, you know, I couldn't sell it to my friends. <laughs> like let alone anyone else. So like, yeah. It's not working. I, I think my sales strategy wasn't working either. It's that uh, not trying to do it for the money yeah. worked, you know? <laughs> yeah. it really worked. <clears throat> and it was not I, a I bad way to spend a Friday night, I'll tell you that. You know, it was good. And like you were saying you know there there's been some scholarly research into music playing music yep. jamming together that kind of thing and using the jam as a way to help people was very much at the root of the jams especially like like especially with BMT when like me and Rob were like talking about jamming and what it meant mm -hmm. and hanging out with Billy and getting into it with him a little bit about yep. why it was a good thing, you know? Uh, and then Zach who was also like, you know, went to school for psychology and took psychology and music classes and stuff, mm -hmm. you know? So, there was part of, and like, you know, especially with Ear of the Rat, I mean, I was doing that lightly intentionally. Yep. Um, you know, you got a bunch of like agnostic slash atheists, right? And they don't have like a religion. And then you basically like just doing the jam and like having it at the same time every week. And it, it's got a, like a certain amount of like en group enthusiasm. Yep really did like fill a space you know that people have like just to do that exact kind of thing yep having it on a friday night was good uh a i mean it's the end of the work week for most people mm -hmm. so it's a, a great time to just want to like blow off a little steam and get ready for the weekend kind of right thing, you know? and then also you know it was we were keeping the sabbath and making it holy yeah yeah <laughs> right because <laughs> it started after sundown on friday so i don't know that was and i think it i think it helped it was certainly like you know what i mean it was certainly something to do it kept me real busy for a while yeah uh and like there's some really good music that came out of it 
met some good people. And, you know, there was a bunch, like even Year of the Rat had a lot of people come. Billy, Billy's Masonic Tavern had a crazy amount of people come in and out of it. Right, right. Just from the, the open stage that we did every Wednesday downtown for a while there. Right. Like, so that just beefed up the numbers. Like, it was, it was to play with at least 200 different people all together, you know? Yep. Under the Billy's Masonic Tavern banner. Right, right. Like that's ridiculous and they were i mean there's some good stuff i don't know if you when's the last time you heard any of that but it's like pretty good yeah pretty pretty good <laughs> then uh ear the rat there's some great stuff sb5 is some really good stuff okay i think i'm running out of gas so, so something I'm, something I want to ask about actually, um, kind of pivot a little bit because I know yeah. one of the other things that continues to happen is the, and and we kind of touched on Guelph for a little bit, and like I said, maybe that's a thesis for another day. But I think it's exciting that you know Open Stage and Home Rock does seem to be, you know, it's not a it's not an Ontario thing only, but I think that. There's a really good scene in in Southern Ontario. Um, the Home Rock, at least as far as I'm concerned, is like like Gordon High. Yeah, and that's what that's what, what I wanted to bring up with next. Yeah, actually. because so, I know there's an annual memorial jam for him in Toronto to this day that happens every year. Like I think he he liked playing that. Like he liked doing performances. Mm -hmm. But he's like a homebody. I think that's part of like this is like to be honest too. Like it, the jams were like all of us in there were like pretty like a lot of fringe dudes. Yeah, you know what I mean. So like, I know especially Gord. It's not that he wasn't like he wasn't really outgoing. But he wasn't like a complete introvert either, right? Mm -hmm. um, like in high school, he was always an ass to me. But it's like that really mellowed out like after university. Mm -hmm. um, now I know the other guy like in Clockton that he played a lot with, there's this guy, Jordy. Mm -hmm. He was a real introvert. Like, you know what I mean? We go hang, and that was the thing. Like one time, we went to Gord's place in Toronto, and we hung out there. And for two hours, we just sat around the radio, listening to uh, the best show on WFMU uh, with Tom Sharpley. Right? Like we went to see the, and like he didn't talk. The other guy never talks. Yeah. And, and we're just like listening to like people talking on the radio and it's like okay well great to see you <laughs> like, yeah you guys have a great night Woo! so you're like road trip to toronto so to be honest <laughs> i think that's that's where some of home rock comes from right it's that yeah he is a real homebody and he just liked to be at home playing music and he's not wrong there's a lot of like professional musicians that got if it's not their home it's a place they live in for a time and make music in yeah right it's like they don't they're not necessarily going to some studio well i think especially these somewhere. days you know especially these days where you know for two hundred dollars you can get a half decent interface and off you go i mean you can record anywhere now um, yeah. truly i mean um you know con considering we had to deal with this crap <laughs> you know and you know yeah. everything out of this just sounded wrong which was part of the appeal now i mean it's funny you know like i was saying i've been watching all these podcasts and now and 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 youtube videos and stuff like that and now a lot of producers you know will have a hybrid mix um 
uh, well, hybrid I know mix. It's a task cam, um, right? you're, you're recording on a tape cassette. Yeah. And I know they did it at like, it's, it records at a faster speed, right? So you get a better. Uh, yeah, that's the idea. It. You get like 15 minutes out of it instead of, you know, out of a 60 minute tape kind of thing. Yeah. Even still, it doesn't, that's not cutting it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like compared to but, what you can do now. Yeah, and this is the thing key. is there's plugins to add saturation so that it sounds crunky. <laughs> like, the other thing that's important, I guess, contextually for the whole BMT OTR jam stream, right? Just conceptually, is it's post Napster. Right. And like as we've seen since Napster, it really hurt independent music. Yeah. Right, made it really hard to make a living doing that. Yeah, and it was that, it, but... and it was that that barren in between time when no one was buying CDs anymore, but the internet speeds hadn't gotten to the point where things like Spotify could be monetized, like yeah, as it is today. People hadn't, uh, like apparently, you know, despite some there being record collectors Spotify, out there, yeah. they weren't selling like record players. Yeah, and there's this huge LP revival right now, which has been great. I mean, I think that's actually, on a side note, I think that's what, what, what's happening now is digital release and then vinyl. instead, And that ends up being the release instead of being CD, vinyl, or, or you know, CD and cassette. It's, it's actually, you know, vinyl and then digital. Digital, and, yeah. You know, and then the vinyl is, is like my kid, he buys he buys records he goes he gets the digital download link off the you know the in the record sleeve and gets the you know gets the free download from itunes or whatever onto his phone but then he'll listen to the record and look at the sleeve and do all that stuff that that we used to do and i think that's great i mean he's got oh, a without ton even of stuff. having the record player well he's got a record player okay. and he's got a record player but he'll play but but the point is, yeah, when he, he'll sit in the basement in his bedroom and he'll li listen to the record and he's got a bunch of Mac DeMarco and a bunch of other stuff. And he'll look at the sleeve and do all the stuff we did. But then he also has a digital copy of it on his phone for when he's in the car. And he doesn't have to worry about transferring it or ripping it like we did because you j when you buy the album, because obviously it's vinyl, I mean, you you're not... You're not going to go and transfer it you, and never mind that in actuality it'll be a different master right because vinyl is completely you know vinyl has like is actually really squished in what it can in you know and from an analog perspective you know something like hip-hop would just bounce off of it if they you know some of the stuff the digital mixes of hip-hop songs for example would probably just skip the needle <laughs> yeah, be so fat, right? So they end up they end up mixing it. They master it differently when they make the vinyl. Is what I mean to say. When CDs got really big, like one of the things that happened is, like, you could get record players, mm -hmm. but there was a let's short period. Like, well, it was about ten years, I would say, from about two thousand five to from ninety five to two thousand five. Yeah, where like record player equipment was way too really expensive. really hard to find and it, you, like if you were going to buy a, a turntable you're paying a thousand dollars yeah and needles were like a hundred bucks a pop 150 yeah. and all the record pressing companies had closed down as well i mean like we're you know we're in the opposite i mean third man records has got a record pressing plant in in detroit and another one in nashville you know, you know, and why? Because Jack White loves vinyl. So he like started a vinyl pressing company. Um, I yeah, just think that's exciting, you know, but that that's what's happening is there's, there's this huge revival now. The other thing too, is when I was in that psychosomatic climax machine band and I had some aspirations to being like a space rock group yep. performer. Like I, we went to a space rock show in the States, right? And I met like people who were my actual, like they were aspirational. They were my heroes at the time. Yeah. 
they weren't it, it's this band uh what is oh, that's terrible i can't remember i remember a nubian lights which is what they became afterward Was it Pressure Head or is that the name of the album? Anyway, it's not that important, but Len Del Rio was the guy I was talking to. And he was one of my heroes, right? Like, I thought that him and like the music he made were like one of the best things going. And I thought, and he was in LA and I thought they were wicked popular. Mm -hmm. And I thought they were doing very well. And like, they weren't. He would like worked part time at a record store. And like he was participating in this, like, you know, he was playing with Hawkwind at like an all weekend festival. And, you know, it's like, yeah, we're, we're barely going to make enough money to cover like being here from this show, you know? Like, we're not making any, no one comes to see us in LA. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> Like, yeah. Oh, and and really, like that was, I pretty much gave up trying to make money in music at that point. It was like if I could get some money out of it, at least like I could use that to like pay for gear. Yeah. But yeah, like we, I wasn't as good at it as that guy was, and they were, it, you know, and they were at what I considered to be the peak of the space rock game. Yeah. Just not, not flourishing at all, you know? So it, it kind of made a lot of sense to just keep doing it like for fun on like a hobby basis. Right. And that's what we were doing. And like I say, like I did have, you know, there was some background in like the psychology of music and uh, what happens when people are jamming together, right? Mm -hmm. That kind of- Yeah, we have really shared DST, flow. Yep. Or like, you know, those moments where like it comes together and like, you know, you got five different people who will all like stop and then start. Yeah, well, there's been studies about how brain waves resonate and shit. Like it's, it, it's crazy. Like it is, it, 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 it it sounds kind of like far out there, but you know, in actuality, there is there is something where you know the music itself can you know hit certain you know uh, isotones or whatever, and but also you know within jazz, I mean, it, it, there's stuff that happens within jazz improv that we were doing, even though we were playing rock and space rock. Um, but it's the same, you know, it's the same difference regardless of the genre, right? Um, and I don't think it was about the genre like we were talking about earlier. I mean, I, I mean, certainly there was stuff that, you know, ended up being very ambient due to our shared influences and, you know, different generations of space rock. But uh, and it was an experience. Yeah. And, uh, you know, comparing the two experiences like the BMT to Ear of the Rat, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a reason that Ear of the Rat went a lot longer than. BMT did, mm -hmm. right? And that's, I think there was a certain amount of overreach with BMT. It's certainly, uh, I like, so I heard like a, like a thing about like, a, this person was talking about Timothy Leary. Mm -hmm. Now he screwed up the psychedelic movement by getting it out to too many people too soon. <laughs> right, because okay. it was, Doctors were using it and like a bunch of professors and stuff. They were doing like legit studies with it. Yeah. Actually, those studies have started up again in Canada because it is right. a lot of it's legal here. Like um, not specifically for medical purposes. I mean, you know, like, but there, well, there are people, there are people dropping acid in universities in Canada in studies. It's supposedly cool. it's, it works wonders with alcoholics. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. There's um, there's a lot of research on it for a recovery. So, yeah, like so, I, I think there is there was a chance that it could have been things could have been different if it hadn't been thrown out there into the public sphere as quickly as it had been. Because uh, I don't know that he 
I thought he probably imagined everyone would love it and all get groovy. Yeah, like I, I, just the, I just did a quick wiki search here and like a uh, Google search here rather. Yeah, there's a whole page on CAMH Canada's about the benefits of LSD therapy and and since uh, just a couple of years ago now, um, I guess it's looking like the last last 10 years or so there's been a huge revival in research within Canada because it's um, you know a lot of this stuff is is still criminalized um, but it's not but but it's allowed for medical purposes here unlike in the states where it's just class uh, you know you can't touch it but uh yeah this is fascinating yeah so I thought the BMT was sort of they had a, a suffered from a little bit of the same problem. It was like a little bit too much too soon. Yeah. And uh, I think it worked. I think it worked better as a private party than it did as a a public space. Yeah. One, it was always like you know because of the marijuana smoking, it was always flirting with criminality. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Move so, point now, but still. <laughs> well, you you probably still wouldn't be allowed to smoke indoors, right? Yeah. And you know, and it was really weird. You know, we always tr like really with the two Bond Street, we didn't f around. Like we yep. didn't break any rules. Right. While we were there, you know. So it's like you know we kept all the smoking outside and like people would bring their own drinks into like a private party, but no, but like there was never, you know, illegal liquor sales or anything like that. Right. And, and, and that stuff happened there all the time. Like when we weren't doing it, we were just really right. uptight about it for some reason. Yeah. Uh, and it, it was just fine, but with me, right. Cause I'm just like, I'm not, getting a lawyer <laughs> you're right yep. it's just just avoid the problem right now and there in the you go by not doing it in the first place yep yeah exactly uh so i really thought you know being able to like and it because and then like one night it got crazy there too i don't know what was going on it's like i don't know who put on the show I think it was like high school seniors. Okay. So it was like uh, that would make sense because that would have been the tail end of that whole that whole Ontario prom scene where where people would just put a fake semi prom on, semi formal on kind of thing. Yeah, there's some, there they was, knew it was there gonna was be like, trouble. There was a bunch of shows, so it was like high school, like senior <laughs> high school bands. Yep. But there's like two hundred people there, and like. For some reason, they didn't hang out inside. They're all milling around outside. And there was this like group of about six to ten punk rock kids <laughs> who were just looking to get into a fight for some reason. Oh, it was really weird. And it was like those punk rock kids were like a real pain in the ass for like a week or two. Mm hmm if he just kept being around like one time one of them dragged like a big tree branch into the space and then left <laughs> what is that <laughs> it's crazy yeah it was it like it was <laughs> and it was just like just some weird weirdos being weird <laughs> and yeah i never got over that like that like we we went out it's like look guys like why are you all out here what's going on like if you're here go inside enjoy the show yep. talk to each other indoors and if you're not here well, go somewhere else don't be out here blocking the road right weird don't why is this happening <laughs> but we never had that problem when it was in the basement you know yeah we always know who was coming and then you know there was such a you know, because there was always about 10 people involved, right? Like everyone would like have a different buddy they'd run into who'd like 
come out once or twice. Yeah. People there was a there was a pretty steady rotation, I think. Yeah, so there was pretty and a pretty big well to draw from here in St. Catharines. Mm -hmm. I mean, I I think what we did with Two Bond Street, like I don't know if it would never have happened if we hadn't done it, but I think a lot of the things like scene, like. Because I know the people involved with that, like they were using our space a lot. Yeah. And I mean, if I get a chance to interview Steve Stumble, I'm sure I'm going to be able to definitely right. uh, definitely find out where the interconnections, because I know that we're two or three degrees of separation between all of us, right? Well, I think that's how that's a topic. Up I think that's how they ended up developing a relationship with the NAC at first, right? Right, Just, right. You know, we had a space that was dirt cheap. And they had bands, so it was like a no-brainer for them to just come in there and do their thing. Yeah. Which was kind of nice for us. I mean, it was fun to be there when the shows were going. And when we, like, because it was easy for us, we just opened the doors. Right. And we hung out and sold soda to the kids, you know? Uh, so, and that was fun. It was just fun hanging around. We didn't make, we made a bit of money off concessions, but I think we would be like, even on a night like that where like 200 people would show up, mm -hmm. it'd be like 20 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe 60. Not great, but still, like I say, it was just fun to be there. But like, I think that it got, things really going because I know those shows were really well attended. Now all we did was have the space. I mean, they, they had like, I know like you say, stumble records, they had a huge like mailing list. Yeah. Right. And so whatever they were like early adopters of social media, right? Like right. Or Facebook. And it, they really made it work. But yeah, like I say, I think it it created a there was a brief period of like huge buzz, right? right? And then you know that scene was good. I mean, a lot of different bands get to play. Yeah, I, I seen. I I thought you know it it grew to a point when like before festivals really blew up that it for a time it was sort of our own north by northeast and i think that it it just grew too big for itself and and um you know i mean i know that there there was some other stuff going on they just you know stopped stopped running it really um, um i don't know that that's like i said i i would love to have a, a conversation with steve i um i remember reading something in the standard about how the promoter that you know took over for him or or let like he had you know, had a, a business deal to do do it. The one when that last big one that happened in Montebello Park, apparently, you know, there was stuff going on sour in the background or something. I have no idea. Um, I only know what was in the standard. Um, right. But I and and maybe it's just a matter of you know all those festivals kind of you know got big and then petered off and and um, you know even even with the revival of Lollapalooza, they didn't tour it anymore. It just was like, okay, we're doing it in Chicago, done, kind of thing, right? So, um, yeah, you know, it's so weird because I always had the impression of music festivals as being like weirdo shows, you know, like Burning Man. Yeah. Right. Where was a lot of like. Or Coachella. Yeah, but even Coachella is like, isn't there like a lot of pop rock? Well, yeah. Coachella is pretty mainstream, there. right? I mean, it's well. That's what I mean. Like yeah. Coachella is specifically not as weird as, right? You know, no, Burning Man's out there. Burning Man's like, yeah, like, right. It's a brain, or Burning Man's like, like Mad Max for like you know. Was it yeah. Electric Eclectics or Eclectic yeah. Electrics, whatever it is? Yeah, right. That show, like that's 
Never mind the yeah. fact that they're burning a wicker man. Thank God there's not people in it, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, you know, there's some pretty hey, there's heavy there. You know, if you want heavy pagan uh, symbolism, there, <laughs> that's definitely it. Yeah, and I feel like, like you say, like now when we think of outdoor festivals, we're thinking like Coachella, right? Yeah, and yeah, that's the whole thing. It's yeah, become like, these pop ones, which yeah, are like kind of North America's answer to like, um, you know, Redding or whatever. Yeah. And like, I don't know. I, it just doesn't appeal to me. Yeah. Uh, Although I don't think we'll I, be having, <laughs> I, I don't know. Like, I don't think there'll be any this year or next summer. But, uh, but I feel like Indian, and maybe part of the reason is I'm old and I no longer care as much, but I feel like Indian music as a genre is in decline right like it's always going to be there because music's pretty accessible to just about yeah. anyone but um in terms of it being like an industry it's nowhere where near where it was in the 80s right yeah and i i think it's kind of homogenized a lot more as well i mean there um and i think part of that's the inter because of the internet where we have you know a small group of of artists i mean there's 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 still a lot of subgenres that are huge i mean the stuff that you know the stuff that we that is now known as americana or canadiana you know that that whole bit of stuff that you know up here in canada um you know northern pikes um grapes of wrath cowboy junkies the stuff that was country but don't call it country kind of kind of stuff um has you know those subgenres are are still kind of growing because the other part with the the other aspect of it with the internet i guess what i'm getting at is that everything has a long tail so you can find your five fans but no. you know but but as far as actual indie as a scene everything's indie on the one hand and nothing's indie on the other hand you know on the one hand everything's indie because everyone can self-produce and on the other hand nothing's indie because you still have the big old machine that you know yes anyone can get on spotify with distro kid for example or cd baby or whatever but to actually get on a playlist or to actually get on satellite radio you still need a major so it's on the one hand, it's it's completely democratized, and on the other, it's like 1977 all over again, because if you want to get through the noise, you want to cut through the noise. You still need some sort of, you know, promotional support at least at at that major label, major yeah. label level, right? Whether or not, whether or not you're actually signed or whether you just got some sort of promotion deal, and then to top it all off, even with all that Spotify, um, even with the Spotify clicks, you're still not going to make you're still not going to make money unless you go out and tour. And of course, no one can tour right now. So everyone's fucked. Yeah. Well, there is that. Oh man. So, you know, I'm glad I have a day job. <laughs> I'm glad I'm, I'm glad I'm better at, I'm, I'm glad I'm better at computers than I am at guitars. <laughs> well, you know, I picked a decent time to have to be on parental leave. You know, there you go. So it kind of worked out. I was like, well, I had to stay at home anyway. So, yeah, not too bad. And I didn't have to like scramble to get like the EI in motion or anything, it was already right. all set up. Yep, so that's good. But yeah, I don't, I still wonder about the uh. I don't know if I would try and do like a music podcast again. Mm -hmm. Although I think about it sometimes. I did one for a while there. Mm -hmm. I know that personally, I don't listen to any music podcasts. Yeah. Which is one reason why I suspect it doesn't have um, the legs or like the broad appeal. It's like, I, <laughs> I'm not interested. Yeah. Music podcast. Why would yeah. someone else be? Yeah. I feel like there's ways to like, you know, that one I put together for the radio 
I don't know if you heard it. I mean, it's okay. But that's like another thing where like I banged it out in a day mm -hmm. and I really should have taken like a week to put it together. But I didn't. Um, it's pretty good. It's not too long. Mm -hmm. It does provide some detail, a little bit of history. Yep. And then also some. So I, I actually have considered like at some point, like doing like a, maybe we try this again. If we could do a Zoom meeting that had more Zoomers. Yep. And then do like a listen, like bring up a, a, a night or a couple mm -hmm. of different nights maybe. And That's just not a bad them. idea. We can certainly you know, do like that. listen to some of it. So you can play some of the music. I mean, we don't have to, you know, go for hours with it, but you, you, you know, let a minute or two go. Yeah. And everyone talk about it, you know? Yeah. I think something like that might be interesting. It might be fun to do just like for, yeah, like ex jammers. Yeah. To revisit the jams. I think to do that together, it might, it might be, it might I'd be, be interested in doing that. Fun to do. Could... I don't know how great it would be to listen to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like that might be, that might be something that just might be good. Something that we can do with the zoom and, you know, I don't know if anyone outside of the four or five of us that are on it would be interested. Actually, I don't even know if anyone will be outside of you and I will, will ever listen to this, but, <laughs> but it'll go off on the archive and <laughs> it'll be added to it's going to be added to it and we'll, we'll see um but i like the idea of of of, of doing that we could certainly uh we could certainly set up another call uh sometime in, in the next couple of weeks even and, and do yeah. that. i think that'd be fun and you know the more i think about it there was such a you know the jam it was so just lazy Let's just get together and like hack around yep. kind of thing. But then there was all this like, like there is behind it a lot of like pretty serious thought. Yep. And you know, there's a lot of reading. There's a lot of, there was some genius in the madness, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, I think that, I, I think that the vision was there for, you know, for what the concept of the Friday night, the EOTR Friday nights was. And, you know, it was a little bit, you know, we, we had put some effort into it to kind of polish it a little bit. Um, but then the other, the other aspect of it was, you know, especially when I was drinking, sometimes, some nights just be too drunk. <laughs> and I, I'd be like, oh, well now this is not, you know, now this is yeah. not a thing, right? But I mean, I, now I'm almost four years sober, so I'm like, I look back at it now, and I'm like, well, you know, actually, uh, I'm it still enjoying playing. It was pretty party intensive there at some point. Mm -hmm. It got progressively less, so yeah. I was see for me even back in the Billy Smith like tavern days, I really was thinking a lot about like addiction and like addictive behaviors. And addressing that through the music mm -hmm. and you know there yeah because it was a real party kind of culture yeah but at the same time i really was uncomfortable with that um you know like i remember one time for my birthday my girlfriend at the time had bought me like a pipe like for pot smoking in right for my birthday and i was just like i mean i i use them so I, that that's good but getting high wasn't like it wasn't a badge of honor really for me it was more yeah. like um I'm, a, I'm addicted to marijuana <laughs> I, yeah yeah <sighs> 
so as much as that was really like a very I, I didn't I didn't consider smoking marijuana to be integral to the jam. Right. It was a large part of what happened there. But I certainly didn't think it was necessary. And I was hoping not to encourage it. Either. Right. I know we drew a line in the sand at some point about drinking. Um, Cause at least two people got talked to about like showing up too drunk mm -hmm. at some points. Yep. Like, Hey man, like we all drink here, so that's not that big a deal, but we don't get drunk here. You know, no one's, yeah, well, I remember, and we're not going to, no one's going to mention any names about this, but I do remember people, you know, being asleep on your old porch. And, yes. uh, yeah. and I remember people being sloppy in, in, in this room. And, and myself, like I said, I know that I got to the point where I was having a hard time managing the webcam. And there are some nights that you can see things are not great. Um, yeah, but that's you know I I, I don't want to go down that that hole too much. But I mean you know like I said I'm in recovery and I'm grateful for that. I mean I've got a life and a career and everything's fine. I mean things are pretty good, <laughs> so not a big deal. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and like you know and maybe like I say maybe it was just getting older. Mm -hmm. But sure. Yeah, it's like well we want to party, but no one like there's no reason to be getting sloppy and like peeing on the floor or anything <laughs> you know right <laughs> yeah oh man and that you know that used to happen I've seen that a couple of times i still don't i've never been that drunk thank goodness uh We've, I think we've come to a bit of a, yeah, I feel like we covered a bunch of ground. Yep. Certainly didn't get to everything. Because I feel like, for me anyway, there was a lot to unpack. Yep. I mean, we didn't really get into the space base, space basement. Yep. Uh, the big fun philosophy and like, the funnest of all possible worlds or or really too deep into like i mean billy's jam philosophy isn't really that difficult to explain it was like well you just show up and jam just play right. write songs why i don't know let's just start playing we're good we'll play we'll just play. right play just just play don't worry about don't worry about it you know that's and it worked and it was and and like i say the what really i think that it almost it appeals like because it's almost like gambling right right but you're betting on yourself and you really have created an opportunity to fail and then when it doesn't fail and it sounds great and you're having a great time and it feels awesome it's extra awesome because yep. it's, I can't believe we just winged that, you know? Yeah. And then there's that, and then going back to that, um, the cooperation, the um, communication, when you realize that other people are picking up what you're laying down, you know, or, yeah. you know, you, and you've, or you've started with a random drum loop and um, just set a couple of samples up uh, uh, to, to just go um and then baseline comes down and the next thing and next thing you know something's happening <laughs> somebody grabs the mic um yeah so tell me about big fun i mean i think that that is the best to say what i'm going to do oh, <laughs> as far as that goes i know i'm like i know i kind of want to leave you hanging um cuz you know one time i was talking to people about the big fun philosophy it was that like a friend's house and they mm. had they had three guests it was me and another couple and 
I think other people were coming, but that's all who were there at the time. I don't remember, but mm-hmm. they're, they're like, come on, start talking about stuff. So I was going through the big fun philosophy, right? And really it's just, it's just that you, you kind of know what fun is when you're having fun, right? Okay. And then, uh, and then I qualified it with, well, you're not actually having fun. You're being fun. <laughs> right? And then you know what being fun feels like. And those fun feelings are telling you something, right? Right. They're pointing you in a fun words direction. Right? And that these fun feelings emanate from the funnest of all possible worlds, which is like, if you take all of the possible realities, one of them is the funnest. <laughs> and that funnest reality is send in fun feelings down through, you know, the multiverse. Mm-hmm. And when you feel or those across the zoom across the zoom encryption, right? When you feel <laughs> those fun feelings, when you're being fun, yep, you're headed in a fun words direction towards the funnest of all possible worlds. Because when you always choose the funnest choice, you know, you'll be having the most fun, right? Right, and then and then it complicates a little bit because people like get well, and then. So that here's the thing is that like when I told these people that the girl looks and she goes, are you, are you saying we're not fun? <laughs> it's like, you know, no, like it's not this, about you. I'm like, uh, until you spoke just now, that absolutely had not crossed my mind. Right. <laughs> oh. But you know, you, actually, you seem, until you mentioned it, I thought you were fine. Yeah, now that you said that, I'm like a little concerned uh, that maybe you aren't very fun. Yeah. But uh, if you don't get the big fun philosophy, you're not hitting fun words. But <laughs> yeah, and it's it's on the one hand for me, it's like very like important because fun is like one of these like kind of ideals that are like they're ineffable you know yeah beauty yeah and ephemeral yeah right what is it what is it and yeah ephemeral too right because you you're having fun and then it's not fun yeah some things are fun the first five times and then the sixth time it's it hurts yep right so what's going on right and that's that's where i was i, I kind of like i was all in on fun points you fun words mm-hmm. but then what's fun how come things that are fun aren't fun forever right and that's where the idea of the kind of the funnest of all possible worlds kicks in yeah because it's not linear it's not even linear like temporally right it's not chronologically a linear thing it's it's not in a particular direction because it's not located in a reality right so it's right. it's a thing that's outside of time and space that's affecting you in time and space and trying to help you have fun right like right But I, I mean, and it's right. And and so it's about connecting with your feelings. It's about awareness. It's about attention. Like all of these things like are all part of it. But then nine out of times out of 10, especially when like you're in a band and you're talking to people about it, it's like, oh, fun is getting high. It's having sex. It's shitting on people you don't like. Like this is this is what fun is. And it's like, oh, well, no, maybe not. That would, I don't know if that's what I said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I, I hear you, but then all of the things that you mentioned, like, are they fun? 
you know? So yeah, it's like, it's, it's important. It was certainly a part of what I was trying to get across while I was there. Mm -hmm. um, but I always felt like it wasn't, it wasn't landing, you know? Yeah. Maybe I wasn't saying it right. Maybe I wasn't setting a good example. Uh, maybe it's just nonsense and not really worth talking about in the first place. You know, it meant something to me. It still does. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd always meant something to me. I mean, yeah. And yeah, I just know at the time I was really like, it was a real drag to be trying to promote it and like just constantly like uh, it, basically I was getting two res one of two responses right and like one you don't think we're fun and then like oh you're trying to to fuck me it was like well, no, I'm, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> it's not one this wasn't what I was talking about I was talking about your feelings. I was just trying to talk about feelings, man. <laughs> just trying to talk about the deep down underground sound. And uh, I was just being vulnerable <laughs> for a minute. And then you shit on my heart. Yeah. So, like, it wasn't, it, it wasn't working for me. I, I still believe it's important. And, like, and again, like I was reading books all the time and mm -hmm. I would take all of these science fiction and like fantasy concepts and try and work them into stuff. And I was always trying to shoehorn whatever thing I just learned into my experience, you know. Mm -hmm. well, you know, I don't get a chance to listen to that stuff that much anymore. Like my daughters are still too young for mm -hmm. all of that. I think I think even to find it interesting, let alone deal with some of the I think mostly it's pretty clean, but it gets like raunchy sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, there's hilarious bits uh with Phil. Do you know do you remember Phil Naylor? Um he I we we didn't overlap. Um I yeah, okay. I don't think I met, I, I don't think I attended any jams that he was. Because he was a huge it. part of the BMT stuff. Mm -hmm. And the fun thing about Phil is that he was this very clean cut. He's always a bit of the dad of the group. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, calm down. This is a neighborhood. You know, mm -hmm. he was, you know, he was the, the, the calm hand. Yeah. Right. Uh, but when he got on the mic, filthy. <laughs> just, he just g go off and it was just like almost just dirty. He sang a song. The, the chorus of the song was Don't Have Sex with Your Grandma. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. It's just like, yeah super funny but that was for us anyway it made it like extra funny right because it was mm -hmm. the he was the the last person you'd expect to right. get on the mic and right get raunchy and like he was just kind of like funny. bob saget when he when he when he stopped doing clean <laughs> everyone was like wait what <laughs> yeah absolutely like and like really like yeah. just burn the hair right off your head scorching yep. like wow you're blue on a whole other level <laughs> yep yeah so yeah you know that's one of the things that like here's a guy who wasn't musical had no aspirations about being a rock star mm -hmm. but he got bullied by his friends to get on the mic and you know, we saw a whole side of them we never knew existed. <laughs> Fantastic. I think there were a lot of people, especially like who ended up getting on the mic. Yeah. Right? Just getting 
put into that situation. They found like a whole new part of themselves. You know? Right. Because uh, most like, you know, the only other people that that happened to is really people who got on the drums for the first time. Right. Because I think, I know, uh, like I know me and Rob, we had access to a drum set and uh, took advantage of it. And Rob got pretty good. Mm -hmm. I got better. But I know from the jump, I was like, oh, you know, now that I've had a chance to just kind of sit here for 15 minutes and work at a little bit, mm -hmm. playing drums is easier than I thought. You know, like it, just in terms of like establishing something basic, some kind of 4-4. Four, four, yeah, I still, you know, it's crazy. I don't know if I need a left-handed drum kit or what, but I can't play to save my life. Yeah. Still, uh, all these years later, yeah, I can, I'm, I'm half decent with keyboard. I can play guitar. Never been. I mean, I even, I even have a hard time with a drum machine. Well, this um, is what I'm yeah. trying to see it, say is yeah. that people, you know, well, that's not true. You know, there were a few people who got up uh, and offered their instruments to other people. Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, so there are a lot of people that played <clears throat> bass for the first time. Yep. Guitar for the first time. A lot of people got on mic for the first time at DMC shows. Mm-hmm. And some people really took to it. Yeah. The those the, a lot of that's up too, eh? Uh, yep. Oh, I know. I, I like I've 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 dug through the archives, and I, I'm going to put some links when I actually do make a YouTube of this. Um, it's certainly not all of it, because I know. Oh yeah, of course. I think Billy had a. I got a lot of it from Bill. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I'm sure he's got lots that I don't have. Mm -hmm. um, there's all kinds of video that exists that I think no one has but me right now. That would be neat to digitize. Uh, you say that, but it's not necessarily true. Because uh, one of the things that we did on purpose there was no one to work the camera. Uh huh. So we kind of gave up in terms of trying to set up the vid visual <laughs> in, in like a place where you could see everybody because just right. Billy's basement wasn't set up that way. Uh huh. There wasn't a spot it could go and you would see everything. You'd either see half of everything or. So a lot of times, sometimes it is set up so you can kind of see like a field of people, but sometimes there's like, it's like it, it's just it, in front of a lava lamp. Yeah. Like it, right. So there's right. a lava lamp for an hour and you just hear the audio. Yeah. Which is what we were recording anyway, was just the audio. Yep. And uh I mean in the early days of it, I was playing it on my radio show. Mm hmm Well, I yeah, I I and that 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 and and maybe that's where that proto um podcast kind of thing came out of it as i was saying earlier that um because i know a lot of the ones that a lot of the stuff that you have online are the radio show itself i know there's a couple that you edited through and then there's a couple where it's like here you go <laughs> and then you've got a bit of a blurb about that what you remember of that bmt session and that's it that's what's on our archive uh yeah. for that particular thing but yeah, I, I mean, even if it, it it's something where, I mean, again, that's probably a lot. That's it's probably a lot bad. to go I, through. To go through everything. I wish I'd taken I, more notes at the time. Mm -hmm. It's part of the reason I took more notes with Ear Laurent. Right. Um, I've always been real. I was always real particular about trying to get the dates. Mm -hmm. Right. So I would know when stuff had happened. Um. Uh, I started trying to get keep track of who was there. With yeah, the rat, it was easier, right? Because I was mm -hmm. recording, editing, posting. Right, right. So I was there. I 
just to keep track of anyone new that showed up. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think, I don't even think they necessarily get added to the days that they're there, but uh, everyone that ever played, I'm pretty sure is on a Facebook page. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like there's everyone that ever showed up and did anything that says what they did and who they were. Yeah. I'm pretty sure everyone's up there. At least I tried to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I feel like I derailed the conversation there. What were no, no, it was about? good. So, well, uh, just um, well, we were talking about big fun, and, <laughs> and then we were talking about um, some of the people in BMT that were. Um, oh yeah, because. Well, yeah, I got all melancholy there for a second. And that's the problem is why I gave up talking about fun because, like, I got a lot of the other <laughs> instead. It's like, oh, you like fun, do you? Try this grief. Like, what? What? Because that's not what I was talking about. But it was, yeah. Yeah. That wasn't that. So, and then yeah that's that's i think i'm running out of gas matt yeah no, i haven't been up this good. late in a while no neither have i actually <laughs> um well i you know this has been really good and i don't know if you want to have another session we could we could pick this up i would like to because i think uh i mean there's so much more that we need to cover i think this needs to have a part two i feel like there was more to cover yep um and i also feel like we know a little bit more about what we talked about maybe if you get a chance listen back yep and take a couple notes yeah and i'll also I'll also throw this on Google Drive so you can take a look at this as well. Okay, great. And then we'll and then, both be prepared and we'll we'll do it again. <laughs> I think if we come to it with a bit more of a checklist. Yep. Uh, and then uh, try and try and maintain a little more focus. <laughs> uh, I think we get something useful out of this. But yeah, we covered a lot. Yeah. And I do like you know it was a big part of my life and i do like mm -hmm. talking about it and and and, and like, like you really, said we've hit the talk radio age of our life so let's create some yeah absolutely and i really did like i threw my heart and soul into this stuff you know like mm -hmm. and it was it was coming from a very like real honest place of trying to you know make the very best of my life with what I had going and like, yep. you know, I'm taking a lot of information in and then using that in the jam space. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I think just to close up um, our conversation for tonight, I mean, that's something that I always realized and I recognized uh, and appreciated about what you were doing in that, I mean, for a lot of people, it was a lot of people, maybe it was, just a, a reason to, to go out and get high and, oh yeah, there's some people playing, making noise in the basement. Um, but, you know, I always appreciated what you were doing. What, 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 I don't know if I necessarily got the greater vision, but I, I loved the greater vision of it. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, especially, uh, especially the, the, uh, the later days of of uh, being in your basement, and then uh, through the other two basements after, um, I think we uh, we made some really good music. Um, other nights we made some really big noise, and I think we had a lot of big fun. And uh, I mean, yeah, at yeah, the very well, least, I think it was always kind of interesting, you know. Yep. There's something a little different happening. Uh, I tell you, I've listened back to it, and sometimes it's like so close to being right 
that mm-hmm. it's it can be a little frustrating to listen to right like oh <laughs> oh if only <laughs> why are you a d flat everyone else is in d yeah exactly <laughs> All right. So yeah, we'll pick it up again. We'll have another session. I'll throw this on Google Drive for you and share it. And okay. um, uh, once it converts, and uh, we'll we'll plan another session. I, I don't know if I, if you want to have a couple of days, maybe we can do it sometime in the week or, or whatever. But yeah, let's definitely take a couple of days and like, give it some thought and regroup. Yep. And right. like, yeah, maybe we'll have a conversation before we record again and yeah. strategize a little bit. And, that sounds great. You know, if you like Zoom, I think we get a couple more people in here. Yep. <clears throat> and, and I think with uh, another couple of voices. And, well, the conversations I think should continue, but I really, I think I'd like to try the listening party. Yeah, I think we should definitely do that as well. I agree with that. I, I think that's you know, definitely a, a go. is a great time to try and yep. get something like that through. So. Yep. Yep. For sure. And, uh, I have Zoom now, so. Yep. I had to get it so my daughter could attend a virtual birthday party. So. Okay. So, well, that's good that you already had it installed on the phone. Yeah. That's perfect. I'm glad you didn't have to do separate download. Um, all right. Great. So, um, have a great night, and uh, we'll, we'll do. do another session. And uh, we'll definitely look at getting some uh, EOTR listening sessions together. I think that's a great idea. You know, looking awesome. Sound good. Good to talk to you, Matt. Yeah, it was great to talk to you. Have a great night, Jacob John. You too. Take care, bud.